lovely to see so many uh, people shouting out in the chat already. Do do give us a wave. Let us know uh, where you are. We've got someone in a, in a bunker in Cheshire East. Um, uh, we've got Marina Del Rey and, and Laura Dale. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a pop group right there just in the place name. So lovely to see so many people here. Great to be talking with Brad um, across oceans and, and continents. Um, this is how the evening is going to work, a little map to a slightly complex evening. So uh, there'll be a brief intro from me, uh, then uh, Brad and I will, will talk uh, uh, for 15, 20 minutes or so. Uh, that'll include some, some photos uh, that Brad's got for us, five images, which will just help locate us in <clears throat> bunkerology and, and architecture and the geography of this this book and, um, uh, and, and the phenomenon, it, it, if that's the right word that it describes. Then uh, we have a, a VIP, of which more later, five minute super special appearance, which I'm greatly looking forward to. And then um, Brad, Brad and I will chat a little bit more. Uh, I'm gonna spring on him then without warning, uh, except that I'm warning him now, a quick fire round of questions at that point. Uh, and then we'll see where we are with time then, uh, but there will certainly be 15, minutes minimum for for your own question so please do um put them in the q a section and they'll find their way to us uh, via that and uh keep them coming as, as we go as they occur to you it'd be it'd be wonderful to hear, hear from you and then brad uh, at the end will um i think hang around a little bit and hang out as he puts it in um in in the text chat so there'll be a chance to engage with him there so that's where we are I'll, I'll, i just i mean this is an extraordinary book i think that's the first thing i want to say and, and the second thing i want to say is that it's by an extraordinary human um it, it couldn't really have been written by anyone else and i haven't read anything quite like it it's it's hyper modern it's uh, very historically cognizant it's written by somebody who is a, a, an adventurer but also a, a scholar of real rigor a cultural geographer um, but also an ethnographer somebody who strays over borders um, in in life and in thought as as well. It, it runs from Herzog to, to Haraway, from ancient Rome to the Cold War to um, far into the future. It has a pretty dazzling range of <clears throat> tones as well as of altitudes. And um, many people are calling it prescient, but uh, in a way I, I don't think it is. I think that's slightly patronizing. Like, what, what Brad has seen in this book was was all around us. It's just it's condensed into visibility over the past six months in, in ways that has made it a very co common phenomenon that is that is sheltering in place, taking refuge, um, prepping for the future that is actually already here all around us. So it, um, it, it is a kind of brilliant, uh, brilliantly foresighted text, but it was also tuning into something that in fact has been around for millennia. It just takes on new and powerful and contemporary forms. And of course, with our human exceptionalism we feel that, that that we're experiencing this for the for the first time and and most powerfully it's a hard thought hard fought book um so uh i think you know buckle in um throttle down bunker up hunker down and um off we go brad uh can we un unmute you wonderful welcome um tell us where you are first of all Rob, thank you for the beautiful introduction. Um, I can I can imagine my editors writing down the blurbs as you were speaking, so <laughs> updating the back cover. Um, I'm I'm in a I'm in Big Bear, California, uh, which is about two hours inland from Los Angeles, and I'm in a treehouse. Um, I I just purchased this remote property. Um, I've got a, a quarter acre of land out here. I'm close to a lake. I'm in the mountains, um, and this this treehouse, this unpermitted structure that that happened to be on this land that I didn't have to pay for, I've now turned into my office, um, and this is where I'm this is where I'm weathering the the pandemic. I was I was really hoping to be in Ireland at this point um, to take up my new position at University College Dublin, um, but uh, I've got elderly family members to care for and travel. Obviously, international travel is extremely complicated at the moment, so. I'm just waiting and watching like many people. Um, it, it might be worth saying that I, I know that you are living in a, you know, precarious terrain at the moment um, in, in, this, in that fire, that fire is a menace, right? I mean, we all, we all know that, but you are, you're, you're close to a front line. And I, I, I situate us like this because it's part of this sense that we are, we are in a, a, 
with constant state of precarity. And it, is that how it feels right, right there in that valley now, even in your treehouse? Yeah, we, there's a, there's a 30,000 acre fire that's been burning um, about 10 miles from my property. And it's in, it's in one valley over um, and luckily hasn't been making its way towards us. There, there hasn't been any loss of life yet. Um, there have been a few structures and houses lost. But it does feel to me like, um, you know, we've been caught in this pincer between existential threats, uh, you know, nuclear war, climate change, uh, you know, runaway artificial intelligence, things that are intangible and difficult to deal with. And of course, the, the everyday natural hazards, natural disasters that um, have always been a part of our lives, but are now increasing in frequency mm. and severity. Um, you know, the pandemic, of course, is one of these existential threats that has now come to the fore. And so it's, it's in some ways, I think, helping us to um, put some mental boundaries around those, those things that, that are difficult to comprehend and kind of put them in more concrete terms, even at the same time where we find it impossible to deal with. Right? I like the idea of concrete terms, which is a sort of, the, you know, the basic, <laughs> basic DNA of your book in all sorts of ways. But um, th that takes me to a distinction you make really early on between fear and dread. Um, and I wonder if you could just reprise that distinction for us, because I think it's a very helpful one. And it, it seems to me that we might be pivoting from dread into towards, a, 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 as it were, a more reasonable and focused fear. But anyway, perhaps you could make the distinction for us. I think that's exactly right. Um, well, so Freud makes this distinction very early in the, in the 1920s. He writes about the difference between what he calls neurotic fear and real fear. So real fear has an object. It has something that we can attach it to, whereas neurotic fear is sort of unbound, right? It's, it's, it's difficult to define mm. um, and it's difficult to know where it's stemming from. Uh, different philosophers through time uh, uh, pitch this in different ways. I tend to rely on Kierkegaard, where he thinks about um, the difference between fear and dread. Dread being this thing that is very hard to, uh, to, to bring into focus, right? Mm. It's more of an affect than an emotion. Mm. It's not a response to something necessarily. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a welling up within us. Um, and when I started working on this project, looking at people who, and spending time with people who were building bunkers around the world and building remote properties and, and stockpiling food, the overwhelming sense that I had was that everything that they were building was a kind of architecture of dread. Yeah. Right. It was, they, they were, they were building for the unknown. Yeah. That really reminds me also of phobia, which I think if I remember rightly, Freud has a, a wonderful definite, it's something like um, building a fortress against an ant or a fortress against a termite. And I was, there's a, sometimes one looks at, you know, preppers and, 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 and bunker makers, and it, it feels like they're raising a fortress against an, an ant, that they're almost phobic. Um, uh, but, but actually, when you began, you felt they were sort of dreadful in that old sense of the word. And now I sense over the book, we'll come back to this, uh, that you perhaps m moved into a greater sympathy with them over the course of, uh, uh, of, of the time. Is that is that broadly? Fair? We'll come. We'll dig into that a bit further on. But is that is that broadly? Yeah. No. I I I certainly began to feel that. Um, I mean, you know, we all go into our research with preconceived notions about why our research subjects or interviewees are doing what they're doing. Yeah. Um, and I kind of imagined that I was I was delving into a kind of you know right wing, paranoid, very conservative, anxious community. And actually, what I found was a was a broad social, political, religious, ideological spectrum of people mm. who were building to give themselves peace in the present. Mm. Um, it, it, it really wasn't, um, it wasn't so much about the future, but I know temporality is something that I really hope we can come back to in this talk because time plays such an important role in, in these spaces as with um, so many underground spaces as you've beautifully written. Yeah, I'm thinking about the sort of end end stopped heavy heavily teleological eschatologies of the rapture, right? Which is where you just you just got to spend a bit of time and then you get beamed up. Versus the you know the long term survivalists who want to hunker down so they can continue rather than so they can come to the end. And that yeah. Well, this book is full of paradoxes, and one of those paradoxes is that the people who are often most prepared are the people who believe in an afterlife. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I would I would expect that these religious communities who believe that they're going to be raptured uh, would not find it necessary to prepare. And I did run into some of that, um, but I also ran into these um, uh, differing 
religious conceptions of how that would play out. So for instance, if you believe that you have to make it through the period of rapture, or through the period of tribulations to get to the rapture, then of course you have to prepare right. yep. <laughs> because you're yep. gonna go through this period of turmoil. So um, yeah, religion does play a role in, in some of the prepping that I ran into, but certainly uh, it was not an overwhelming factor. You take us back to the beginning, two beginnings. First of all, the beginnings of bunkers. So, um, uh, what's the uh, what's your earliest bunker in history, and and why is it not a cave, <laughs> or, or not um, only a cave? Let me put it like that. I I I read a definition for a cave once that it it doesn't that it I, you must know this that a that a, a a hole in the ground is just a hole in the ground until a human enters it, and then so it's through the you know, it's the, it's the anthropogenic <laughs> insertion of the body, you know, it, you know, the human interaction is what makes it a cave. Mm -hmm. um, I think in the same way, <clears throat> a bunker has to be intentional. Um, and so, sh of course, there were people in prehistory who were um, turning cave spaces into bunkers by stockpiling things and fortifying them. Um, but I was interested in, in uh, a, a sort of concrete example of where we could see defensive measures being put in place um, yeah. and and I ended up back in Anatolia yeah. uh, in, in what is now Turkey when when the Hittites began carving out the volcanic tuff there and building these subterranean cities in what is now Cappadocia mm. um, and one of these cities uh, could actually house 20,000 people along with livestock uh, uh, food water and they had these these sort of meter high millstones that they would roll over the entrances of the cave uh, to seal them off from intruders. Uh, later in time, of course, these were used by Christians who were being persecuted by Romans. Uh, and so I, I come up with a, with a bit of a wild theory in the book that potentially the story of Jesus rolling the rock from the cave actually comes from the, the, the bunkers at Cappadocia. So, I mean, yeah, I could have traced that back further, but of course, you know, once you start moving into the realm of archeology span rather than history, um, things become a little bit more complicated to define, uh, despite the fact that I do have a background in archaeology. I was going to say, you know, you're, you're allowed I, to I say that. <laughs> 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 I no longer have the credentials to go there. <laughs> um, that, two things then. So just so a bunker needs to be modified in some way, even if that's only taking supplies in there, um, it, or is it just to be occupied with the intention of it serving as a shelter? Well, so I think it's an it's a it's an anthropogenic space. It's a, it's a, it's a very human. It's only a human space. I don't know any animals that um, build bunkers in quite the way we do. Cave um, bears, I'm, I'm, bears wombats, maybe I bring them up in the book. Um, but yeah, what's in, what but, yeah. but what's interesting, I think, is that uh, human beings have this awareness of our mortality. We have an awareness of the future. Obviously, we don't know if animals have the same level of consciousness in terms of temporality. And so this is where we start getting into the bunker as a space of time. Uh, because what, what human beings are building the bunker for is to, it's to weather the unknown, the unexpected. Um, and there's a, there's a time frame often that's attached to that. You know, it's three weeks, it's a month, it's a year, it's winter. Right, it can be seasonal, right? But the but the bunker has a very particular temporality that humans imbue it with, um, mm. and I guess that's what I'm saying. I haven't seen evidence of animals having this sort of foresight to think not only is disaster waiting at the door, but you know I'm going to make it through a particular period of time. Well, I mean, my my counter case to that would be that the hibernating would be the hibernating bear, which thinks, "Hey, winter's coming. I've got to I've got to bide this time. I've got to spend some time in this sheltered space." But anyway, we'll leave. Okay, we'll let's, leave. let's 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 do a paper on animal bunkers, please. Okay, that would be <laughs> ethology, so much fun. ethology, <laughs> and bunkerology. I'm on. We're on. Um, <laughs> I want to ask you one more question uh, arising from Cappadocia, and Darren Curie, and then maybe you could show us some images just to. Uh, just to locate us a, a little bit, but re reading about Darren Kuyu, hearing you on Cappadocia, sorry, Darren Kuyu being the deepest of the, the cities, um, yeah. I was struck by what a communal bun bunker that is. Like that, that is designed to take a people, um, at, to take an entire city and make it safe. And I was thinking about the, disjun the disjunction between the, as it were, the selfish bunker and the generous bunker. 
um, and 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 between a sort of bigger social responsibility and then the, the forms of um, uh, uh, sort of privilege that you that you map and follow across the globe as you as you follow the money. So I wonder if you could talk to us about the the generous bunker and the selfish bunker, if those make sense as terms. I love that distinction. There's a there's a, a famous episode of the Twilight Zone, I'm sure many people will have seen that um, uh, was produced sort of at the height of the Cold War where someone builds a bunker in their backyard that is just for them and their families, but they build it in secret so their neighbors don't know that they have it. And there's a, there's a false alarm, very similar to the one that we had in Hawaii in, in 2018 when everyone got the text message saying there's a ballistic missile incoming. And, every, and, every, and so the family rushes to the, bunk, the bunker um, and the neighbor sees them and comes with them and they, they of course lock him outside. They say, there's no room for you. In here. <laughs> and so the, the complete social fabric of the town unravels because of this horrible betrayal. Really? Huh. Um, so yeah, when you, if you look across time, this is precisely what you see is that people were building uh, uh, communal bunkers. And then as we move, um, into the Cold War, it, it becomes a, a private endeavor, and and that has a lot to do with um, uh, uh, with government policy. It has to do with geography. It has to do with urban planning. I mean, there's a host of reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, we could also think about World War II in the UK when people were building those Anderson shelters in their yes. in their backyards, right? Yeah. So it it became um, the responsibility of you know, the individual, the citizen, the family to protect themselves. And that's part of the, the atomization of social life that has sort of brought us to the point we are. What I found fa so fascinating about these bunkers uh, that, that I visited for this book is, as you say, they, they are again communal bunkers. We're moving back um, to this phase where people are building new tribes. Uh, they're they're, they're uh, coming together to excavate, to build together. Uh, and there's there's very much a sense in these communities that um, uh, they're they're bringing to them complementary skills that are going to be necessary to uh, get them through an event. And so so they're building a community resiliency that has fallen away in the past couple of decades. That is so. So if we can take a look at some of the some yeah, of the photos, um, yeah. and I can I can I can show you some of these bunkers so you can get a sense of what they look like. So here's our here's our backyard shelter. Here's the one where you lock your neighbor out of it. <laughs> these um, these are uh, people continue to produce these. This is a company in in Dallas, Texas, called Atlas Shelters. Uh, the scale of the production of this place was uh, absolutely incredible. Um, I watched them ship three bunkers out of here in the course of two days, uh, and they're overwhelmed with orders. Uh, these are very much like the the Cold War shelters of the past. They're being uh, often being buried uh, covertly in the middle of the night without the neighbor's knowledge. And uh, um, so there's still a thriving backyard shelter industry. And that was those were some of the first places that I visited. But if we move on to the next photo, what you see here is uh, a bunker community in South Dakota. These were these were five hundred and seventy five. Uh, um, uh, munition storage bunkers from World War II, uh, Second World War. Sorry for you, Brits. Uh, and uh, what you what you've got here is uh, an area three quarters the size of Manhattan, which is now being occupied by families uh, that are moving in and building a new community. This is called the X Point. It's it's supposed to be the point from which humanity reemerges after a, a great cataclysm. Is there a um... You used the word tribe earlier, which is a really, really interesting one in you know, apocalyptic thinking, as we know. Um, I've just noticed how far that this geography, this scene goes on in the background. You know, it's just, I see it's taking <laughs> about size, but is there a requirement of faith uh, or, or do you have to, what, what community tests do you have to pass or do you just need the right, right amount of money to buy here? It's, it's basically a buy-in. Yeah. Um, uh, I should say that I took this photo with my drone, and if you if you don't fly over this community, you absolutely can't get a sense of its scale because it's in the it's in the Great Plains, so it's completely flat out there. Well, pretty much flat. Very little topography. Um, Where are they getting uh, water from? It, uh, so water was an issue. Yeah. Uh, the the de the property developer who is selling these bunkers is a Cal is a California property developer named Robert Vecino, oh, yeah. and he said that he would not bring water into the first occupied block until he had thirty bunkers sold. So he was kind of encouraging 
uh, you know, it, it starts to feel like a Ponzi scheme. You know, he's encouraging the bunker builders that live there to buy in uh, or to get other people to buy in. And then at some point they raise the prices to bring in more revenue. And so the, the people who were first there get their infrastructure funded by the, the, uh, the people who didn't have the foresight to, to buy in initially, right? So you're sort of punished for buying in late to the community. Um, I have to say though that the, even though this is, this is a real estate development, I mean, we, we have to call it what it is, right? This is like an Uber gated community. <laughs> um, uh, I, I think I call it Blade Runner, a, a gated community on steroids. It's like, you know, this is this is like the, the Blade Runner uh, vision of the future, right? These sort of gated enclaves that you just fly from one to the next. Um, but the people who are moving into this community are, are incredibly sweet, sincere, um, uh, generous people who were very happy to invite me in and, and show me um, what they were building. Um, and they're, they're, they're from a broad, spectrum of um, uh, vocational, sorry, I've got a military aircraft flying over here. Um, <laughs> probably dropping water on that fire. Uh, <laughs> I've got a, a broad spectrum of people here who are from different um, social religious uh, uh, backgrounds, different demographics. I mean, it's a pretty um, diverse community and, or more diverse than I expected it to be, let's say that. Uh, if we move on to the next photo here, so this is uh, the Sanctum. This is in just outside of Chiang Mai in Thailand. And this was a, a, a set of four villas that were being built by um, uh, a Canadian. Uh, he called it an eco-fortress. And his, his plan here was to build something that was totally self-sufficient. So, I mean, obviously you can see he's building it with defense in mind. There's no windows on the bottom. Um, he's got a sort of glass door trap in the front where he can he can trap people inside. Um, and he's got a nuclear fallout shelter under this as well. But the inside of this thing is an open atrium with vines and a swimming pool over the, the fallout shelter. It's covered with solar panels and he's putting up a wind turbine. And his idea is that he can be totally self-sufficient in this eco-fortress. And if we move to the next one. This is the survival condo in Kansas. This is a, a 15 story inverted skyscraper, which in the book I call a geoscraper. Um, if it were flipped upside down, it would be the second tallest building in Kansas. Uh, but at, at the, what you're looking at here is actually the roof of the, of the nuclear missile silo. Um, and uh, Larry Hall, the, the property developer here is an ex-government contractor who used to build bunkers for the government. And now he's spent 10 million building his own bunker, which includes this um, rather outrageous swimming pool with a, with a waterfall in it. So that, that gives you a sort of um, a bit of a range of the places we're looking at. Um, I don't know if we, is that all the photos we have? No, five or, ah, yeah, yeah. Oh, right. And so this is a, uh, Chernobyl, as many people recognize, that is the new sarcophagus. Um, and in the in the coda of the book, um, we take a journey into Chernobyl um, illegally, as I do, um, to to visit the the uh, the uh, sarcophagus um, or get as close to it as we can. And the idea, well, we'll we'll talk about this later. We'll touch on it later. But you know, thinking about what the post apocalyptic world might be was also part of this book. Well, I think we should talk about it now, but I, <clears throat> but but I don't think it. I think we should hear from our our, our guest. Um, so I'll very brief because it's a perfect segue. I'll very briefly introduce Wayne Chambliss, who's going to appear on your screen, who is a, a close friend of Brad's. Um, uh, much find him in the acknowledgments to this book. The acknowledgments are a beautiful paratext themselves. But um, uh, a geographer, an adventurer, a scholar, a poet, and um, a, a very very good chess player. Um, as I found out, like cost, and he's uh, in, in honouring Five by Fifteen's commitment to storytelling. We thought it would be great to have Wayne appear and and tell us a five minute story uh, arising from the trip into Chernobyl with Brad, which is told in the coda. So I hereby mute myself and hand over to Wayne. Thank you, Rob, and thank you, Brad, and the Five by Fifteen crew for having me in to do a little Nicki Minaj verse in the middle of your, your rap session. Um, now, for those of you who've already finished Bunker, I'm the Wayne that gets mentioned in the coda. 
uh, and for those of you who haven't read it yet, I, I wanted to say a few words about this last somewhat mysterious chapter of the book. So two years ago, Brad and I uh, met up for an intrusion into the Chernobyl zone of alienation, uh, or simply the zone. So this is a policed area, 2,600 square kilometers large that surrounds something called the sarcophagus, the flesh eater, which is an entombment of the nuclear reactor that exploded in 1986. Um, the zone is a place where nature has vigorously reasserted itself in the wake of catastrophe. Uh, it's probably the largest example on earth of what Bruce Sterling once called an involuntary park. And we wanted to get right to the heart of it uh, for reasons I'll get to in a moment. Some of you may already be aware, you can get permission to go see parts of the zone, uh, go on a guided tour. We did not seek permission. Uh, cho choosing instead to cross the whole damn thing on foot and to experience it as much as was possible on our own terms, uh, despite certain additional complications. Uh, to facilitate this, Brad and I and two others did hire a guide of sorts, a stalker, self-styled after the characters in the Strigatsky Brothers famous science fiction novel Roadside Picnic and uh, probably more realistically, Andrei Tarkovsky's film adaptation of that book, Stalker. Um, our guide had supposedly crossed into the zone more than a hundred times illegally without being caught. That was not exactly true, as it turned out, but he was astonishingly good at what he did. Um, possessing, among other qualifications, a superhuman sense of hearing and enough operational knowledge of the zone's workings to identify almost without fail, and usually seconds before the rest of us had even heard something, exactly what that out of place noise signified. So when to shrug, when to hide, when to run. It took us four days to get across the zone and slip out. Uh, and in that time, there was plenty of adventure, mostly in the Roll Admonson sense of terrible planning. Uh, there were also moments I hope to never forget as long as I live. Uh, fording the River Utz at flood stage, naked, packs above our heads, across the invisible threshold of the zone. A leucistic owl, big, as a seagull and being surrounded by Shavalsky's horses stampeding in the dark invisibly like low flying helicopters. There was the sight of the others marching ahead, long vines gripping their boots as if the spindly arms of some forest floor creature were trying to drag us back into the tall grass running in between the trees through barbed wire and giant spider webs, laden with liters of precious water that we absolutely needed while being chased by military police and an angry dog named Pirat, pirate, which hated our guts. Tiptoeing past the most dangerous thing in the world under the Milky Way, as men that were in white radiation suits, shoveled underneath portable lights in the red forest, digging probably for black market plutonium. There was that first gorgeous specimen of Soviet modernism as like an exoplanetary outpost jutting through the pines. And like you saw in that picture, rooftopping the dead city, watching bolt after bolt of lightning strike the sarcophagus. And our escape which probably uh, should be documented in a Keystone Cops video at some point. <laughs> but you know, I, can, I can hear you asking, it's like, why? Why would you go to all of this trouble to navigate you know, the objective hazards of the zone, to face, at best, uh, uncertain consequences if we got caught? We were in the middle of a war, after all, between Russia and the Ukraine. Well, I had my reasons. Um, which like Cyrano de Bergerac 
well, I'll keep to myself, but I'm going to speculate about Brad's. So in, in part, we were there to see for ourselves what it would be like when one finally does exit the bunker. The bunker is time machine. The bunker is chrysalis and re-enters a world emptied of humans, scabbed over with a poison Eden. It was a sinful landscape that we crossed, full of sin. The sinful fruit of merely human knowledge and what that sort of knowledge seems to lead us toward as a species, age after age. It was a beautiful place, devoid of sinners, but where the sin remains, corrupting, contaminating everything, invisibly, every surface, every stream, every overripe apple my companions chose to eat, every blade of grass. You emerge from the bunker on the 15th day and everything is there for you, right there, to do with as you will. But it's all been ruined somehow. Ruined and made horribly, unpredictably dangerous. I thought, no human can escape what humankind has wrought. But really, we were there to experience the totalization of Brad's bunker project. The sarcophagus at the heart of the zone contains a wound, a cosmic wound that will take 20,000 years to heal. It's a threat so dreadful, so far beyond human comprehension that the mere idea of its containment in some sense turns everything inside out. It externalizes the danger, others it, and makes a bunker of the human, of the world. Wow. Wayne, <laughs> how do we come back from that? Oh, man. Should we just sign off there, Brad? I mean... Yeah, I, th I think we're done. We're done. We're done here. <laughs> that I will not be the only one. In fact, I will be one of more than a hundred people who 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 long to read the book of Chambliss. Um, uh, so um, uh, seek out seek out this man's writing, and and what an extraordinary um, uh, moment that was. Evocation, Brad. You must be pretty moved listening to that. Oh, uh, you know in the absence of having a book from Wayne on our experiences, spending time with Wayne in those places and being able to relay those stories is a, is a great honor. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, our adventures will continue. Will <laughs> I have no doubt about that. I appreciate it. Well, huge, <laughs> thank thank you, Wayne. Yeah, to Wayne. Um, I'll, I'll just um, jump in there and remind you uh, in the audience, please do send your questions through uh, via the Q and A function. Um, they'll be they'll be building, I know, uh, and they can arise from from anything I think that that is uh, central or peripheral to what we're talking about here. Um, uh, Brad, uh, that amazing moment where Wayne kind of um, uh, turned turned the whole world inside out, so that the world becomes the bunker to the sarcophagus. It's the place we shelter from from the ultimate sin, as it were. Um, uh, I, I, and I just wanted to to ask you about that 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 total inversion of the of the world itself as a sheltering place, even when you're in the open. Um, I, yeah, I, I, can you follow that thought that that image uh, yeah. for us a little? Well, well uh, you you write in Underland, and I'm going to butcher your words here, but you write that you know the underground is a space where we we bury what we want to forget and we also bury that which we want to protect. Mm, um, mm. And, you know, our entire <laughs> biosphere then is, is this bunker that has been protecting us from the cosmos and we've slowly been chipping away at the concrete. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, you know the, the roots are cracking the, the foundation now. Mm. Um, we're feeling 
the weight of the world um, coming in on us. Uh, and, and, and it does feel like, I mean, I've seen some of these images of uh, uh, bunkers that have been installed where sort of water has seeped in and the food buckets are floating around. And it's kind of like your worst nightmare that your space of survival becomes uh, the space of contamination. But it's also a fantasy to think that we're ever going to live in some kind of <laughs> pristine space that, that is that is free from friction and contamination. It's a it's it's you know a space of complete rationality. Um, humans do not operate on a rational basis, as exemplified by those horrible things that we bury into the earth. You know, trying to return them to geological time, and then yeah. inevitably they seep out and haunt us again. Mm. Um, so, you know, the 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 bunker is a fantasy, um, mm. but I guess the question is whether the um, uh, the confidence trick that it instills in us um, gives us enough hope to move forward. I write I write in the book that that you know hope casts a dark shadow, um, and that's certainly the case with these bunkers that are being built with a hopeful eye to the future, but also an expectation that the future will not hold together in the way that we expect. It makes me think of, I, I write very briefly in Underland about the, this, the Finnish folk epic, the Kalevala, um, which gets gathered like many of these by an antiquarian um, in the 19th century, but seems to have first been sung as an oral epic in the sort of 13th century uh, Baltic Karelian region. And it too contains a, a warning scene about basically waste that is buried far underground in a in a bunkered space where it shall not harm humanity but of course Vinamoinen and others and uh, are you know seized with the hubris of of delving and go to go to free free the waste and it in, a, in an odd way we've been warned but didn't listen to the warning but in another way we're still here to hear the warning um <laughs> echo across across seven centuries um and i guess that that takes me to towards your ethnography so I was struck, um, it's a very peopled book, profoundly peopled book, You're, um, and I was very struck by your tenderness towards many of the people you met. And I think I, I tried to work out why this was so surprising to me, and it, it, I suddenly realised that, of course, in, in many ways it seemed to me that preppers would be the most self-reliant and self, as it were, defended of people, and therefore that they might be hard people to extend a tenderness and a compassion towards. But that seemed to be your default setting. You, you wanted to find the good in people. Um, and I wondered if you could talk about that role of listening to people, as you did, uh, and then also what you found most hateful. Yeah. Um, I, I, I never planned to be an ethnographer. <laughs> you know, I, I began my career as an archaeologist and I moved into geography, but I just, I love hearing people's stories. Um, and uh, I guess I also enjoy the challenge of getting access to communities that are hard to access. Um, and I enjoy the ch putting myself in a place where I'm slightly uncomfortable, whether that's in physical or emotional terms. Um, and so spending time with people that I don't necessarily agree with and, and trying to understand where they're coming from, I think is incredibly valuable, especially, especially today in a time where there there's, you know so much um, um cleavage you know in in our political leanings so much partisanship um i think it's important to listen to why people feel the way they feel it doesn't necessarily mean that i agree with them um but i can identify with the feeling that they have that um uh that uh you know the the world that we've built is fragile and that things are going to fall apart. They are building these bunkers um, for the same reasons that that I might go out and on a protest for climate activism, you know? Um, they're building them because they're afraid and because they, they want things to change. Um, uh, you could certainly argue, and I have, that the money that they've spent investing in building these kind of um, <laughs> microcosms of, uh, American society uh, where they're just kind of, you know, they're rebuilding the same ideological context in, 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 in miniature <laughs> that has gotten us into this situation yes. in their communities. And, yes. and of course, you could argue that it would be better invested, you know, spreading that money amongst 
some sort of greater project, but this is the problem with existential threats. It's very difficult to know where to focus your energy to change these things. Yeah. Um, and I do think that the fact that they're interested in building communities uh, and, uh, and skilling up as mm -hmm. much as buying in <laughs> to these communities, um, I do think that that is, a, it's a marked difference in how people, um, of, you know, the survivalism of the 80s, for instance, right? We think about Ruby Ridge and David Koresh and uh, at Waco and, yeah, and the, the Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski. These were, these were all preppers, right? These were all survivalists, but they had a very different um, uh, conception of, of how they needed to survive. Uh, that's changed. And um, I think it's changed for the better. And I guess that's what I was trying to, to get to tease out of, of what was happening in these communities. Although me, there's a lot of there's a lot of hucksters too that we should talk about. <laughs> let me pick up because there's, a, there's some questions coming in, and a couple of them um, really uh, jump off from 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 what you were just saying. Um, so one is from Emily, and she asks, and this was something I reflected on as well about gender. Uh, men are men more preoccupied by bunkers, prepping, and sheltering than than women? And then a, a question um, asking you to connect a question, asking you to talk a little bit more about the or a little bit about the roles of race and gender in the prepper movement. How diverse these movements are? Um, yeah, I, it'd be really interesting to hear you on those, particularly I guess in an American context right now. Yeah, uh, m most of most of these communities, as you can imagine, are um, men you know, who want to, they want to build and they want to go out and, and uh, make something themselves. But very often they're, what they were building was um, uh, driven by their family's desires and often their partner's desires to have a more secure space. And so it, it wasn't necessarily that, um, uh, uh, that there was a kind of, um, you know, the, the communities that, that they were building there were communities of families, right? And, and it wasn't necessarily that the, the men in the family were sort of leading the charge on building these. And I, I did visit another community in Tennessee um, that were, who were all women uh, and were, were running a survivalist store. Um, and they were very sort of anti-bunker. Um, you know, their idea was that they had, they had planted these secret groves in the forest and they were gonna retreat into the forest uh, when things got bad. And they were going to um, leave the survival store behind uh, for the people that were left behind. They were, they were deeply Christian and they saw this as a gift to the people who hadn't prepared, um, that they would just sort of leave the store to be raided. Um, but, there's also, and I didn't answer your question previously about the, the most uncomfortable situations I've been in, there, there is also um, a lot of misogyny in some of the characters in these communities that, that I was spending time in. And that was one of the difficult, most difficult things that I dealt with. Um, interestingly though, those weren't the preppers who were living in the communities, they were the, the real estate agents, the, the people in the book who I call the dread merchants. Yeah. And there's a particularly toxic atmosphere that is cultivated by these people who are making their living off of selling the antidote to people's fears, right? Mm -hmm. And so the, it's in their interest to ramp up the dread, mm -hmm. to ramp up the anxiety, right? To get people to think that the world is falling apart. And, and um, you know, that seems to also, uh, part of that package seems to be people who um, are dismissive of other people's worldviews. Can we pick up on race very briefly there, but dismissive of, I mean, there's a, is there a sense to which a lot of these communities are reproducing, if not white, white supremacist structures of society for, a, for future kind of re-efflorescence are, are certainly, I mean, how, how racialized were these spaces? So their, their take on it, I, there was very little overt racism that I encountered, right? And their take on this would be anyone who wants to be in the community can be in the community, but they have to have the right kind of skills. They have to have the right kind of attitude, right? And so there's an inherent racism in that, right? That if, you know, someone has to uh, have enough free time, enough uh, uh, um, disposable income that they can move into these communities. And so they end up becoming self-selecting, you know, that there's, there's a particular kind of person who's going to end up there. I think that that is, has a lot more to do with, with socioeconomic status than race, though. You know, if, if someone was to show up in this community and they're willing to write a check and, um, and, uh, uh, and they, you know, 
they want to have a secure space and and they believe in the second amendment you know they're going to end up in this community uh, there's there, i don't think anyone would ever be excluded from these communities but as i say they they end up being racist in in the way that they they self-select through that process uh, I, I thought often, as you would have done uh, many times, about uh, Cormac McCarthy's uh, novel, the, the, the Road, um, <clears throat> which has some significant bunkers in it. Uh, one, one of them is a horrendous um, uh, cannibal farm uh, in the bottom of an antebellum uh, mansion where he, surviving humans are being farmed for, for protein, effectively, by the, by the more powerful survivors. The other is a kind of bunker of salvation, which the, the father and the boy discover um, which has been set down in the ground by a prepper, and they they get down into it, and they're just in they're just in heaven. Um, uh, I think about that novel because Graham Warren asks a question about skill, and something you've mentioned, and it it, it speaks back to this question about who can join. Um, in that novel, that that is really a novel about skilling up with a, a sort of old manual capacities, how to fire a rifle, how to you know how to how to scan the ground with with binoculars. So Graham asks. Um, you're talking a lot about time in the future. Can you say something about how ideas of the past get recruited into this context? Skills that are necessary, <laughs> skills that are lost. If, and the, the kicker line for the question is, if bunkers are time machines, what do they bring with them of the past? That's a fantastic question. And, and um, Graham is aware that one of the ways in which I got access to these communities was that um, in my time as an archaeologist, I spent two years um, learning lithic technology. So I, I learned how to make stone tools. So I can make spear points, arrowheads, atlatl darts. And it was a skill that I could offer to these communities. And they were deeply interested in, in, in me bringing that skill. Um, it was kind of fascinating that it became, these bunker communities in some ways become workshops. People learning how to weave, how to grow, how to can, how to hunt, uh, how to make tools. And so there certainly is a sense here that the, um, uh, the, the skills of the past, our human skills of the past that have served us for millions of years, uh, we've suddenly lost it, in such a short space of time. Um, and so, yeah, they're, they are bringing those old skills into these bunker spaces and they're almost becoming workshops for, for retrieving them. Uh, it's, it's a, that is a really interesting point. And it would also be fascinating to imagine an archeology span of the future where in a you know a hundred years or a thousand years we find these bunkers because they're they're of course some of the most resilient architectures on the planet, and finding them filled with bags of stone tools. I mean, it would just totally you know it would just totally confound the the, the future archaeologists as to what you know. This is all out of here. sequence. Yeah, <laughs> it's all out of sequence. There's no there's no matrix anymore. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to give you a, a little quick fire round and then I'll jump back to the question. So you, you've only got 15, 20 seconds to answer each of these. What's your favorite prepper acronym? Uh, and I'll say that mine is is the B.O.B., the, the bug out bag, the thing you grab when you've got to run uh, that you've prepacked. But um, uh, and, uh, and for those who haven't seen the book, it begins with a, an extraordinary sort of Anthropocene pro, found prose poem, which is this glossary of terms and acronyms that arise from prepper and survivalist and bunker culture but what's what's your favorite if that's the right word my favorite acronym by far is yo-yo you're on your own <laughs> um and and my my partner amanda when the book was published gave, i wish i had it here with me but she gave me this fantastic um compass and she had inscribed on the front of it yo-yo and then on the back of the compass it says for the end times uh, and it's one of my most cherished objects. The moment I, I opened it, it became one of my most cherished objects. So yo-yo by far. <laughs> right. Well, that was an easy answer. I think, I think I'm right to say there are photographs on Instagram. Um, there are. Yeah. yeah. I'm Goblin yeah. Merchant on Instagram if you want to go see Merchant. the compass. Yeah. It's a wonderful thing. Um, uh, uh, what are the three key things and the one luxury you would include in your own bug out bag? Oh, three key things. Okay, you need a you need a ferro rod to start fires. Do not take a lighter. Lighters fail. The ferro rod will last forever. Um, I become very good at starting fires with a ferro rod. Um, water <laughs> is absolutely essential. Um, uh, maybe that big it's compass. It's maybe well, the compass has got to be the luxury, right? Um, but. You know, it's hard not to say food. I mean, what you know, what are you going to do without food and water? I mean, you, if you don't have a decent ventilation system on your bunker, you're in trouble too. I don't, it's too three's too hard. 
You can't Please. survive on three. That's fine. <laughs> um, uh, last quick one. If you could take one soundtrack to your, to your bunker, um, which band would be the band you would listen to on loop while you waited for the world to solve itself on the surface? Apex Twin selected Ambient Works Volume 2. I thought we would have a confident answer there. Okay. <laughs> We're I, jump. I, I, actually, I actually listened to that in the bunkers in South Dakota, and there's this incredible reverberation when you close the blast door, right? And, and it's, the, it's the, the, the darkest dark you've ever seen. You know, you can't, you can, you can almost feel the darkness in there. And when I turned on the the music and it reverberated inside the concrete igloo, I almost had an out of body experience. I mean, it was absolutely surreal. Uh, you were not going to disturb the neighbours from down there. I I remember I remember being with you in a, a reservoir somewhere under London when we shouldn't necessarily have been there, and a dry reservoir, I should say, sunken reservoir. And again, you you put on some music, and it was a it was a reverberant space down there. Um, I jump back to these questions because there's so many and they're so good. Um, Okay, Michelle, uh, yeah, M Michelle Underwood asks, I'm interested, perhaps this is, jumps back to something we've touched on already, but I'll just see if it sparks new thoughts. I'm interested in the hierarchies and bunker communities and how they are policed, for want of a better word, um, which is, I think is a really helpful term, uh, particularly now. Is there a tension in how they're organized and governed in your experience? Absolutely. Um, uh, so in terms of this, this, this uh, conversation about tolerance, um, Robert Vecino, the guy who was building out those bunkers in South Dakota, he said to me at some point, um, uh, we don't have any room in these bunkers for intolerant people. Anyone who's intolerant will be thrown out immediately, which perfectly reveals the totalitarian structure <laughs> that is inevitably going to emerge when Robert Vecino decides that he wants to take control of the bunker community that he built. Um, even more Strikingly, I think uh, the survival condo that Larry Hall built in Kansas that I, I spent time in uh, can be, he says it can be buttoned up for five years. And um, I saw someone mention uh, Dunbar's number in here. So he actually, he used that to construct the bunker and what he, he reckons that he's constructed the perfect community. Um, there's 75 individuals in the bunker. He's got food uh, for five years. He's got all the resources you need for five years. He's got redundant energy systems, um, but he also has, uh, uh, you know, the swimming pool, a cinema, a shooting range. And he says that all of these things are necessary because, uh, because maintaining psycho psychological equilibrium in the bunker is going to be the, the major challenge. And, and, and we all know this now, <laughs> having gone through mm -hmm. self-isolation, mm -hmm. that, um, you know, you could have all the resources you want, but, you know, the mental stamina required to, to continue is what's difficult. So Larry has constructed a, a, a tiny world. It's like a cruise ship underground. And what I noticed when I went down there is that he had these vertical screens installed in there, which act as windows. And so he flips on a feed and 4K cameras pipe down a feed of the outside. The question of course is whether the feed that you're seeing is, is real time. Because Larry could feed you once the the bunker is buttoned up, you know, it's like that movie Cloverfield, you know, mm -hmm. once the blast door is shut, I mean, Larry can feed you whatever reality he wants to feed you. He could show you a, a images of nuclear Armageddon outside and tell you that you can't leave when in fact you could. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's, it's inevitable in all of these bunkers or in many of them that a totalitarian structure begins to unfold. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, that's one of the dangers of these spaces. In fact, at there's another place I went to called Fortitude Ranch, and I should mention um, there's a filmmaker I met the other week, Jenny Perlin. She's here somewhere. Uh, she has been mirroring my journey and making these beautiful films about all of the places that I've been going to, and I would I would encourage everyone to go and find her films. Jenny, Fortitude, Jenny Perlin. She, Jenny Perlin, yeah. Okay, but great. she get, she sent me this uh, this dog tag from Fortitude Ranch uh, the other day that says, um, it's supposed to say, prepare for the worst and enjoy the present. Um, but they forgot to print the last part of it. <laughs> I think it's just wonderful. Yes. But the guy, who, the guy who owns this, Drew Miller, uh, he told me that um, once they go into a lockdown state at, at, at Fortitude Ranch, they will not allow people to make any decisions because it wouldn't be in their best interest. And, and that reveals everything you need to know. Wow, what a chilling, what a chilling phrase that is. The autocracy of the bunker once, once buttoned up. Um, we can't not 
uh, not talk about COVID. Um, this phrase that I only learnt when uh, lockdown began in California, uh, it seemed, you know, presciently early, but as we know, it hasn't, hasn't worked. Uh, shelter in place, um, which I understood actually has its origins in um, uh, school um, shooting protocol uh, where is that correct? Where where an active shooter is present, uh, the instruction comes out to shelter in place. Um, yeah, yeah. Shelter in place is a is a phrase that comes from from the Cold War. We've now used it for COVID, but it was also used for school shootings. Yeah, yeah. And and well, I I don't really know how to phrase this question except openly. Uh, and you'll have been asked it seven hundred times in the past week. But um, you know, how has how has the pandemic um, changed your sense of of sheltering in place and its history? Well, it bring it brings us back to. Uh, to time <laughs> because if you if you know you're sheltering in place uh, through an event and you know that that event has an endpoint it's you know it's much easier to sh to shelter in place mm -hmm. Wayne Wayne mentioned the 15th day you know this comes from the cold war the idea that if you shelter underground for 14 days uh, you'll emerge into um, uh, uh, drastically reduced levels of radiation after a nuclear attack so, but the, but the problem of the 15th day is what do you find <laughs> when you emerge from the bunker? Um, the, the problem with this pandemic is that, you know, there's no end point to it that we can see. Um, and so how long can you shelter in place? Uh, it, be it becomes a, a mental game that inevitably we all fail. Um, and that's, that's how the virus gets hold of us again. Mm -hmm. So in some ways the virus, um, makes a mockery of the bunker because you know even if you had spent 50,000 pounds you know supplying your bunker for 3 months you still have to come out after 3 months and the pandemic hasn't gone anywhere mm. uh, you're still going to have to expose yourself to to risk but one of the unexpected arguments that i heard from the preppers at the beginning of the pandemic is that in building their bunker what they had done was they had taken pressure off of frontline systems mm. they didn't need to go to grocery stores they wouldn't end up in hospitals. It was impossible they would end up on a respirator, that they would use up PPE because they had their own. And so they, they actually saw it as, as an act of altruism to build these spaces of self-resilience, mm -hmm. to take pressure off of the state. And there, there is a kind of twisted logic there, you know, that, that we can't depend on the state or we think we expect the state to fail. So then we build these spaces, to, you know, so it becomes this kind of self-perpetuating cycle. Um, but I, but I was very interested that they did, they didn't see it as a, a selfish endeavor. Uh, and th yeah, that's fascinating. And it wasn't just a sort of self congratulatory. Their time has come, and so you know. No, no, not at all. Genuine, not at all. Tactical they, uh, thinking the, on their part, as it were. I immediately got messages from South Dakota saying, "If you need a place to go, come. If you need help, ask. You know, we are we are in a position to offer help now mm -hmm. because because the pandemic is hit." Um, that's, that's as, as I say, you know, very generous people, uh, unlike the dread merchants who were selling them the bunkers. Right, right. <laughs> um, there's, I should say there's been a whole lot of love for uh, Wayne's, uh, for Wayne's appearance. Um, a lot of calls. Wayne, I hope you're listening for, 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 for more Chambliss writing or speaking. <laughs> um, it's hard to find folks, I know, um, from my own frustrated quests, but it's extraordinary, extraordinary work. So. Thanks for those um, uh, those uh, uh, those responses. Um, uh, I yeah. So I want to pick up. Here's a really fascinating question. We've got. I think we've got five minutes more. So um, do pop another. We've probably got one or two um, uh, two two more questions that we can get to, and then uh, Daisy will wrap us up, and then Brad will Brad will stay. So here's a here's a hypothetical one from. Timothy. So Brad characterized bunkers in anthropogenic terms, and I wonder if in the course of his research he encountered efforts to construct more than human refuges founded upon collaborations between human and non-human agents, um, which may take us to, the, I guess, to the, um, the, the Svalbard seed, seed vaults, but I don't know. Is that where you were going? That's exactly where my mind went. Okay. Yeah, I, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the biological bunkers. Um, hmm. I, I also began to, I mean, so we should, we should mention for people who don't know that Svalbard is, is, is a vault to store all of humanity's seeds. Um, well, all of the seeds of the world that humanity has collected um, 
that in a disaster could potentially be uh, replanted so that we could we could reseed the world. Um, that that bunker, of course, was was uh, damaged by um, the melting of permafrost, a direct result of climate change, um, and it's uh, another another uh, uh, moment of pulling the curtain back on the fantasy of the bunker, you know, that we can never protect everything. I, I also ran into uh, people who were using bunkered spaces to um, for cryonics to preserve their bodies. And so this is certainly a, a more than human space because um, often the imagination there is that what they're preserving is not necessarily the body, but human consciousness and that the consciousness um, will not could be potentially passed in a future time into a robotic body or into a body of some other being mm. um one of the most bizarre bunkers i encountered was in las vegas it was built by the uh the head of avon cosmetics gerard henderson um and uh he built it at the height of the cold war and it's an actually absolutely beautiful bunker it it it's like a house inside the bunker with a kind of grass built around it and trees and and so when you're inside the house it you can open the door to the front yard and it looks like you're kind of staring at a mountain range but it was it was purchased a few years ago by uh, a group i forget what they were called the 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 group i don't the uh, a group for the preservation of the human species or something or human consciousness and they were storing human bodies down there, uh, frozen in tanks to be sort of reanimated at some point in the future. Um, so I think, you know, whether we're talking about seeds or heads is kind of, you know, bi biological data that can be passed on. There's certainly more than human in that sense. Yeah, that's a, that's a brilliant idea of these as basically storage storage media held within storage infrastructure, right? That, that, that's, right. That, that's, that's what they share. Um, uh, okay, so one more one more question. Um, let me see which uh, what what I can pull out here. Um, okay, <laughs> the, a very quick one. How much do the Dakota units cost? We've got an interested buyer in the in the in the Q and A. Well, you you missed the first round. They were twenty five thousand. Now I can be the the sales agent. They were twenty five thousand dollars, but they've now increased to thirty five thousand. So um, I, yeah, I imagine as more families move into those bunkers, the the price will continue to increase. They're 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 sort of in blocks. They're in blocks of eight, I believe. Um, and so every time a a block sells out, you know, potentially there's an increase in price as they need additional infrastructure. And eventually, they they want to have a a general store there. Um, there's an artist in residence, Lynn Hagen, who's based in Newcastle in the UK. She flew over there and um, did this incredible installation inside one of the bunkers. I mean, it's actually turning into a, 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 a quite an eclectic community, um, which again, I I really wasn't expecting when I arrived there. Okay, one more, and then uh, then I'll hand over. So this is a rather Lovely one, um, very precise from Mark Usher. There's an intriguing symmetry between your previous work on urban exploration and your current writing on bunkers. Um, Gothic tropes pervaded the writing on urban exploration. Bunkers seem to invoke a more futuristic aesthetic. Uh, was this intentional? And what does it tell us about the relationship between time and space? So. Just a little one. You got about fifty seconds now. <laughs> okay, <laughs> perfect. Yeah. No. No. The uh, it's it's a great question though because um, you know, urban exploration exposed me to all of the hidden infrastructures of cities, and and so then, as you well know, as I move through a city, I just I imagine it. I imagine the cable tunnels. I imagine the rooftops. I imagine the sewer systems, and of course, I imagine the bunkers underneath the city, um, and the bunkers ended up being these kind of architectural follies right it's like this there's this layer under london from world war ii and the cold war um that was never really retrofitted to do anything else it's just kind of an empty subterranean chamber that stretches across the entire city um and that is replicated in so many places in the world and i guess that was my starting point is you know what do we do with these things um and then when i found out that these doomsday preppers were purchasing these spaces and and um turning them into you know bolt holes bolt holes for the for the wealthy and the elite or sometimes for the working class but you know I mean, there's there's a range of people moving into them i just became so fascinated with um uh, thinking of the bunker which is an architecture of the past becoming an architecture of the future so that again 
you know, um, temporality plays uh, such a such a huge theme in this work. You know, these bunkers are about time as much as they are about space. Mm. That is a great answer to a wonderful question and a brilliant end to a fabulous evening. Um, I've enjoyed it so much. Thank you all for your contributions in the chat, um, your questions, uh, and Brad, amazing, amazing. I'm going to hand over to Daisy now and then bid my farewells and uh, Brad may hang around for a little while. So thank Rob, you. Rob, thank, so thank you so much, Rob. Really appreciate it. Great, great pleasure.